inside the sock there would be uh, little toys of various kinds, maybe a deck of cards, maybe uh, jacks, maybe a little um, car that you could uh, use on the floor, uh, but various little toys that would fit. Then there would be fruit, uh, oranges, apples, bananas. Then there would be uh, nuts, so various times in, so that we could pour them out in a nut bowl that my mom had uh, on the table. And then whatever change my dad may have had in his pocket at the time he put together. Uh, the th so that we would come down and that would what we would see first and that is as far as we could go on Christmas morning until after breakfast. So we'd have to wait till everybody else got up. We would sit down at the breakfast table. We would eat a nice breakfast. Uh, and then we would usually listen to uh, Luke 2 and all of us kids were hoping dad would be a speed reader. Never happened. Then we would line up at this door uh, that separated us in the living room that was closed and locked until the appropriate time. And we would line up from youngest to oldest, and I was the baby, if you can't tell. So I was always the first one to go in. Now my dad would be standing there with this very big camera with two bright lights, uh, taking our eight millimeter picture of us going into uh, this setting. The first thing we would see would be the family silver Christmas tree that my mom still puts up. They bought it in 1960. And it's still put up every year. Had the little turning lights. Anybody remember that? Still blue balls. I don't know the thing about blue balls, but still little blue ornaments on there. Around the Christmas tree, there would be a few items that were too big to wrap. And uh, being the first, I would always say, which one's mine? Then we'd all sit around in our little circle in this living room, and we would hand out the gifts uh, to the appropriate people, and then I don't hell know how, I don't know if somebody said go, I don't know what would happen, and then everyone would open their gifts at the same time. It took about a minute and a half. And I swear to you this day, when I was young, they left me under the wrapping paper once. It's just pandemonium. And uh, it was done. Then we're ready to go out and play with our toys, and uh, Mom would go to the kitchen and make our, our uh, Christmas lunch. That was my family tradition growing up. Now, think about how hard it was for me that when I became a part of Shannon's family, the Creech family, because theirs was very vastly different. So we come down in their family. There would be a, usually a reading of Luke 2 and then worship time. Let's sing some songs. Let's make them fast. No. Then, like my family, they'd hand out all the gifts. But they would open them one at a time. I mean, this Christmas morning was about not only the gift, who knows, but also the giver. Now, since when is Christmas about the giver? Why? Because there is Shannon, or there was someone sitting over there. Okay, now who is this gift from? Okay, now open it. I want to write down the giver's name and the gift. <clears throat> really? Because me growing up, this was one of the Christmas trees I wanted. Because you can put more gifts under it. You know, they tried this a few years ago to make an upside-down Christmas tree. It never really took off. But what I hope for us to do this Advent season leading through Christmas is to not just realize the gift that we have of Jesus, but to also pause and give praise to the giver because they both come together. We realize that our holy, heavenly Father 
has loved us so much that he speaks into the midst of our lives. And he doesn't just, he's not just the giver, but he's also given us a gift. And one of the amazing things is that when we read through Scripture, we realize that in the midst of our darkness, a child is born. In the midst of our struggles, a son is given. Isaiah was written some 740 years before the birth of Christ. And in that, God introduces to us the gift. I want to look at this video and remind us, how would you introduce Jesus if he were to show up today? Look at this. If I had the pleasure of bringing out Christ, this is just how I would do it. It ain't got to be the way you do it. You might not think it's just right, but this is how I would do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction. His credits are too long to list. He has done the impossible time after time. He hailed out of a manger in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, by way of heaven. His mother is still headlining in the Catholic Church today. His daddy is the author of a book that has been on the bestseller list since the beginning of time. He holds the record for the world's greatest fish fry. He fed 5,000 hungry souls with two fish, five loaves of bread. He can walk on water, turn water into wine, no special effects, no camera tricks. He has a headshot on every church fan across the country. Even before the kings of comedy, he was hailed the king of all kings, ruler of the universe, alpha and omega, beginning and the end. The bright and the morning star. Some say he's the Rose of Sharon, and some say he's the Prince of Peace. Get up on your feet, put your hands together, and show your love for the second coming of the one and only. That was Steve Harvey at a comedy concert introducing Jesus Christ. And they got on their feet. And they praised the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He turned that place into a worship service because that is the gift that we worship today. And he's worthy of us praising him and even getting on our feet on his behalf to praise him for who he is. Let's see how Isaiah introduced Christ. Let's stand. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 9. Nevertheless, 
there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. By the way of the sea along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on the land of the living, on the shadow of of death a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoicing before the harvest, as men rejoicing when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in blood, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for the burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government there and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and with righteousness. From that time on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We ought to be on our feet. And in the midst of our gloom and darkness and struggle and pain, a light has come. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he comes to speak in to our hearts and into our lives into the midst of where we need him most. I know my heart's heavy this morning because we can stand up for a football game, but we struggle with standing up for Christ. We can shout his praises, but do we? The song that was shared uh, in the praise set by Chris Tomlin is actually taken from a hymn uh, in the bleak midwinter. And in the midst of this song, there was a verse that he kind of talked about but didn't go into the midst of. In the bleak midwinter of our lives, the struggle, the pain, the hardships that sometimes feel like we are hard as ice. Our God... Verse 2 of In the Bleak Midwinter, our God, heaven cannot hold him nor earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. In the bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed, the Lord God Almighty, and his name is Jesus Christ. That is what Isaiah is talking about in the midst of our darkness and pain, our struggle, our loss, our times of hope without hope comes this light, comes this child into the midst of us. And this child is given some specific names. And scripture names mean a lot. Some of you spend a lot of time trying to pick out the name for your child or children. You may have even had a fight over that because you think that Uncle Billy Bob ought to be number one on the list. But some of you have 
originally came to an agreement of what the name of that child should be, to honor, to remember, to celebrate, to reflect something going on in your life or their life. The Bible's no different. You have Jacob, who was grabby, thief, which is what he was, until God got a hold of him and changed him to Israel. The Lord will overcome. You have Isaac, that means laughter, and I think it has a double meaning because Sarah and Abraham both laughed when they thought, Sarah, me at 90, have a child. Uh, uh, Abraham at 100, have <laughs> no way, Lord. <laughs> I'm 56 and I struggle with grandkids. Keeping up with them. Can you imagine? A hundred year old? It's a little bit of disbelief, but I also believe the fact that Isaac brought laughter into their family. Of course, you have Jesus. Literally, the name is Yeshua, which is Joshua, which means the Lord saves. There are 250 names for Jesus in the Bible, over, actually over 250 names, because no name gives a complete description of who Jesus is and what he's come to do in our lives. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, we get a glimpse of four of those names as we remember that God has given to us a gift. The giver, the Holy Father, has given to us a gift of the Son. So as we take some time for unto us a child is born, and his name will be called Wonderful Counsel. Most scholars believe that as we go through these sets that there are not eight names for Jesus, but four names that describe who and what he will do, and as we know, he has done for us. Wonderful literally means that which is beyond understanding. A cut above, better than we could ever expect. How it is described elsewhere in uh, that same word in the New Testament is Job 9.10 uh, that describes God, that he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. David describes it in Psalm 86.10 that you are great and do marvelous deeds. Wonderful deeds, deeds that are beyond our full understanding or that which we can grasp. Judges. As he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond your understanding. It is marvelous. It is greater than we could ever expect. Jesus is wonderful counselor, greater than we could ever expect, who counsel and guides our lives. But this is where we have a disconnect. We believe he's wonderful, we believe he's awesome, we believe he's great, but when it comes to Christ counseling our lives, that's where we disconnect from him. Because a lot of times we think of counsel in our today's understanding of a counselor. Today we look as a counselor, as a therapist, one who can guide your life, one that can hear your feelings and dictate into us that we understand. 
And that's part of a counselor. But in biblical days, a counselor was not just one who understood, but one who gave strategic answers to a way out. Christ doesn't just understand our feelings. He wants to come into us and be one that doesn't just say, oh, just sit on the couch and share your feelings. He wants to be the one that says, I understand what you're going through. Now let me counsel you out. Let me guide you out. Let me lead you through. And for many of us, I don't know about you because I have done this myself, how many of us hear counsel from people, but we keep going till we hear the right counsel. And we may go through five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten people, and some of those people are giving us biblical counsel, but we don't like what they say. And so we keep listening. Until we hear what we want to hear. Aha, I knew it all along. Jesus comes to us and he speaks to us. And he is the marvelous, beyond words, wonderful guide of our life. That's the gift that God has given. It's the gift that speaks into the midst of our darkness. Let's grab a hold of him a little bit this morning. First of all, Jesus is the wonderful counselor because he gives true advice. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything he speaks into us from his word is true. Therefore, when he speaks to us, it is true counsel. Well, I don't like that counsel. That's why we go to other counsel apart from his counsel. I don't remember if I've told you all this story, but many, many years ago I had a friend of mine who was a pastor and this pastor was having issues uh, in, with their marriage and with their daughter. I'd prayed many times. I'd counseled with this pastor. We were seeking for healing, reconciliation, and healing um, and guidance for their family. This pastor went to a non-biblical counselor. Okay, let me just pause for a minute. I think there are times, and we all need from time to time counsel. And I think we sometimes need therapists, and I think God has given us the gift of those who counsel us. But what this counselor did was not give him biblical advice. This counsel's advice was, well, you want to be happy. Life's about being happy. Well, you're not happy. Leave your wife. Get a divorce. That'll make you happy. That'll make your kid happy. I tried to counsel him against it. I tried to say, Lord wants reconciliation and healing. God wants to move in a way more powerful than you could ever expect. This pastor divorced his wife. The family split apart. The kid continued to have problems, and that pastor left the ministry. Worldly advice, not biblical truth advice that comes through our marvelous counselor. Because he wants to speak into us. And his word is always true. But we don't like it. Because it's not necessarily how we feel or what we want to do. And so we go to him for counsel. Maybe we'll go to him last for counsel because every other counsel hadn't worked. But he wants to speak into us because he's the wonderful counselor. 
Why is his word always true? Because he understands us. As Hebrews 4 says, he, we have a high priest who can understand us because he was tempted in every way we are tempted, yet without sin. Jesus understands us. And so his counsel is always true. He knows what we're going through. Do you know that he not only knows what we're going through, he knows what we're going through better than we even know what we're going through? Because he's our wonderful counselor. Beyond words, one who guides us out of where we may find ourselves. So as we're thinking about him, the fact that he is always true, uh, we realize that he understands us better than we know ourselves because he understands uh, what we're going through. Thirdly, our counselor gives us a guide, a prescription for life that will help us to continue to grow spiritually and more into the image of, our, of him. Because that's his desire for our lives. Sometimes he brings us out. Sometimes we realize he's with us into the midst and he gives us strength. But he's always there to guide. But I think the fourth thing about this wonderful counselor is the fact that he doesn't just give us the truth. He doesn't just understand us better than we understand. He doesn't just give us guidance to push through or to get out of where we find ourselves. He gives us the power to move through. He said, and I will give you another comforter, one just like me, and he will be the Holy Spirit who will be not only with you, he will be in you. Holy Spirit's the power. We can't do it. I'm sorry. You can't do it. I can't do it. I can't go where Jesus leads apart from the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. And yet too often we try to do what God has asked, leaded, guided to do without him. We have to have the Holy Spirit. And when was the last time you said, Holy Spirit, I desperately need you. Come into my life. Fill me afresh and new. I'm not talking about just when you were saved. I'm talking about today. Holy Spirit, I can't even worship Christ the way I need to. Will you come into me so that when I walk into this room, all things are put aside so that I can worship you with power and with spirit and with truth? Well, no. That's why we're dull and pitiful. We need him in our lives. When was the last time you said, oh, Jesus, I thank you for what you've given me, but I can't live this life. I need your spirit in me as another counselor to empower me to live for you. We so often neglect the third person of the Trinity. The Father, the giver, has given us the Son, but the Father and giver has also given us the Holy Spirit to empower our life. And we wonder why we run on empty so often. We wonder why when we go to the stores as holiday treat, I'm not going to the store, I'm buying everything online because I ain't going to go to the mall because there's all those people there. And we wonder why we can't get into the joy of the Advent season. Because we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We have a wonderful counselor. 
who speaks the truth, who knows us better than we know ourselves, and gives us guidance, a strategic way through the struggles of this life, but then empowers us to live through it. I don't know about you, but praise God, the giver, for the gift, the marvelous, wonderful, beyond words, counselor and guide and strategist of my life, Jesus Christ.